good. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. I hope you've had a, had a good day yesterday and a whole lot of good quality sleep last night. <laughs> I can't say I did, but anyway. Um, so that's two down, three to go. So today we're going to be having a look at the circadian aspects of physical activity and sleep. And so the way I thought about going through this, yes, louder, sure. I'm also trying to be slower today because I get so excited I race away. I realize that. So I'm trying my hardest to rein it in. If I go too fast, please, please, please stop me. Oh, and before I forget, the book that I referred to yesterday was called The Promise of Sleep. And it's um, by William Dement, D-E-M-E-N-T. You can just buy it on um, any of those online book websites. I'm not very good at that. All right. So I've kind of split the 24 hours of the day into a time to be awake and a time to be asleep. And whether we are awake or asleep is indeed driven um, by our circadian biology. So one of the ways that we can look at um, the wake time is um, by looking at circadian rhythms and physical performance because awake time refers that we are moving and that we are active. And very often as scientists, when we want to look at something, we take it to the extreme so that we can have an understanding of how the biology of that activity works. So we could just look at being active and moving and being physically active, but by taking it to the extreme and looking at physical performance, that gives us an idea of the circadian aspects around um, um, physical activity. And then, of course, there's the time to be asleep, my favorite time. So we'll have a look at the biology of sleep. We'll introduce that today and look at how the circadian regulation plays a role in sleep. And then from tomorrow onwards, we'll sort of start to put the circadian and sleep things together. And we'll look at how they function in a healthy and a diseased sort of scenario. And then on the last day, we'll have a quick look at how we can optimize our sleep. All right. So if you remember this diagram for yesterday, the time to be awake and moving is obviously when the sun is up. So believe it or not, a huge amount of research has been done to look at how circadian rhythms might manifest in sports performance. So there are studies which show that there are certain times of the day at which we are stronger than at other times. There are certain times of the day at which we might have better hand-eye coordination or have greater accuracy have great, better balance or flexibility. They've even done a study with tennis serving, asking people to do it at different times of the day, and they can show that the accuracy of the tennis serve is time of day dependent, as they've done for the time of day at which we might be fastest or be able to do endurance activities at our best. Um, so it seems a little bit strange, but I just want you to understand um, how the circadian um, biology relates to these things. The one thing that I... So let me just go here. So I also showed this to you yesterday, and I just want to highlight this fact here that any time in the late afternoon to early evening is when a textbook teaching would be that we have our best capacity for coordination, fastest reaction time, or greatest cardiovascular efficiency and strength. And so the textbook teaching is very much that if you want to do activities that involve those components, that you should probably be doing them at the latter part of the day compared to the morning. And hopefully by the end of this little section here, I'll have convinced you that that might not be absolutely true. <laughs> so much of this research is done in a laboratory setting. And for obvious reasons, it's easy to control conditions in a laboratory setting. So this is an exercise laboratory. We can control temperature. We can control light. And importantly, we can control what the humans do in that environment. And so typically, they will be given tasks that are relatively simple tasks to do, which could be looked at as components of performance. Because if I really want to look at, at sports performance, I need to be in the field. I need to be looking at people doing a marathon or swimming a race or throwing a shot put, for example. So in a laboratory, it's a worthwhile place to start, but remember that they break everything down into little components. And then because you can't measure, I'm just going to make up something. Let's say we want to measure um, a person's um, jump height, because that's the kind of thing that they will measure. How high can you jump at different times of the day? Um, 
because you can't ask a person to be jumping every minute or every second of the day, it would be un impractical. And you can imagine when you do tests that take it more out of you, like a, a maximal test. Um, what they tend to do is to measure at different time points of the day and then create a, a fit a curve to that performance. So they will, for example, make a measurement at 6 in the morning, at 10 in the morning, at 2 in the afternoon, at 6 in the late afternoon, and then at 10 o'clock at night. And if you're very unlucky, they'll do the 2 a.m. one too. And then they'll plot a curve and say, now we can't say that we have um, a circadian view, because it's not a quite a 24-hour view, but we have what we call diurnal variation in performance. So we're looking at differences between a person's physical performance at different times of the day. Strictly speaking, diurnal would be comparing night to day, but we're trying to create a bit more of a circadian plot here. All right, so what they will typically do in the laboratory is if I lump everything together as short duration maximal exercise. So that's the kind of thing like um, they might measure grip strength, which is an isometric sort of contraction. And you must be thinking, my word, how in the world does that relate to performance? But again, everything always gets broken down into little components. They might measure and this is maximum voluntary contraction. How much weight can a person lift in one repetition or in five repetitions? How high can a person jump? What's the power that they produce when they jump? How fast do you sprint over 50 meters, for example? Um, what is your peak sort of um, short-term endurance? There's a Wingate test, which I'll show you now. Or how flexible is a person? They've done millions of these types of tests. And what they've shown is that whether or not they're studying trained or untrained individuals, lo and behold, the peak in the performances tend to be in that late afternoon period, in line with the textbook te teaching. So somewhere between 5 and 7 p.m. So this is definitely beginning to point to the fact that from a physical performance point of view, physical performance in inverted commas here, um, because these are predictors of physical performance, we may well be primed to, be, to, be, um, to perform better at the latter part of the day. When they look at, um, oh, I just want to show you an example of how this would work. So this is a Wingate test. Um, it's an, if anybody's had the, the dubious pleasure of doing it, it's a horrible test. You sit on this little bike and you have 30 seconds and you have to just work as hard as you can for 30 seconds. So you basically ride your heart out for 30 seconds and by the end of it, I guarantee you, you will be wanting to throw up. And the idea that they look at is what is the maximum power that you can get to and then can you sustain it and then they measure the rate of the decay as well. So it's really a, a, a measure of the maximum power that you can put out over a very short duration. So it would really be an indicator of um, short duration maximal performance. So they'll do this at different times of the day and if you have a look at this lower graph here, this is the power that the person's putting out. It's normalized to their weight. That's why these numbers are quite small. And this is time of day. So this was their power output at 2 in the morning, and then at 6 in the morning, 10 in the morning, 2 in the afternoon, um, 6 in the afternoon, and 10 at night. And you can see they've fitted the sinusoidal curve here, and it shows quite beautifully that performance is pretty dodgy in the morning. And I find it strange to believe that it can possibly be worse at 6 in the morning than at 2 in the morning. So really, I'm super skeptical. And then um, performance is at its best in the, at that 6 o'clock period. So that's really an example of how they would look at how physical performance changes over a 24-hour period. It just can't be like that for the, for the lark. It just can't be like that for the lark. You are absolutely on the money, and I'm going to show you why. I'm assuming you're a lark. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> that's why I can't understand this. Okay, but interestingly, what they did here is they loved in the beginning to measure body temperature. So remember I said that body temperature is one of those variables that is incredibly robust, that's well protected, because we can't afford to go outside of a, of a dedicated range. And so it's often used as a marker of one's innate circadian rhythm, because it is um, not disturbed too much, even by exercise. It's, it's, it's held with, within a... Um, a very tight range. And so they plotted body temperature over this 24-hour period at the same time points, and lo and behold, the curve matches that of performance. And so they went, aha, you see. So um, body temperature, which is a marker of your innate circadian rhythm, seems to be um, the important factor in performing well at a different time of day because we perform better when our body temperature is a little bit higher. And so there was this big sort of way of thinking that to perform well, we need to have a slightly higher body temperature, which I won't go into the details now, but that's just absolute junk. Anyway, 
that's what they did. Um, and you can see this was a relatively recent study in 2012, so this is really sort of the way that, that, that many of the <laughs> physiologists are thinking. Okay, so we can see that the peak is in the late afternoon in the nadir, that's the, the worst part of performance, would typically be in the early morning. And when they looked at longer, and I put in brackets longer because for me, 30 minutes is not long duration. For us South Africans, we're used to two oceans and comrades, that's long duration exercise. That's a bit tricky to do in the lab. There's a number of these different tests, don't worry about really what they do, but they're looking at sort of slightly, they're anywhere between 15 and 30 minutes in duration. So they're looking at sort of um, slightly more endurance components of, of fitness, but not really true endurance. And the, many of them show the same peak between 5 and 7 p.m., but there's a whole bunch more of them that couldn't find any circadian variation in performance. So that certainly threw a bit of a cat amongst the pigeons, and in fact that was just really ignored because it was inconvenient. It doesn't fit the model. We're supposed to be better at performance in the late afternoon. So for me, the question is, well, what about lifelike performance? Because I don't want to know really about grip strength at a given time of the day, unless you're in the world championships for squeezing one of those little things and hitting a, a certain number. I want to know about, about actual performance. And obviously, the difficulty when it comes to performance is that there's so many factors that are at play which are beyond our control in the laboratory, like the psychological and the pressure components. But at least when we look at performance in a swimming pool, it's like a giant laboratory, the indoor pools, the temperature is controlled, and the type of testing that one can do in a, temp in a swimming pool very much mimics what is done in competition. So we might not have the competition factor there, but at least we're a little bit closer. Um, so I quite like this. So this was um, Claire Baxter and Thomas Riley, so they were really the sort of founders of the circadian research into human performance. You can see this is a study they conducted in the, in the early 80s, and they looked at influence of swimming time of day on, on all-out performance. So they had 14 competitive swimmers, mostly females. Um, they were young, they were only 14 years on average. They trained both mornings and evenings, and they tested them over one and 400 meter time trials. And I like that, because that's what they would do in training, and that's what they would do in racing too. And they did it, the test at different times of the day, 6.30 in the morning, 9, 1.30 lunchtime-ish, 5, and 10 o'clock at night. And what did they see? This um, is the 100 meter times here, and that's um, time of day. And the straight line here basically shows you that from 7 in the morning till 10 at night, they just got faster. Okay, so this fits the textbook model, and the same for the longer, the 400 meter, they just got faster as the, as the day went by. So they went, yep, there you go. You see, performance is definitely better at the end of the day, and lo and behold, it matches temperature, and our highest temperature is at the end of the day, which we know, and that coincides with performance, so therefore, performance is definitely linked to high body temperature, higher body temperature. So a similar study, my problem with that was that they were very young people as well. Those are adolescents, and I'm thinking more about what about slightly older people. So this study was repeated, it was a similar study in 2007, and they had 25 experienced swimmers. They were a little bit um, more balanced in terms of gender, a little bit older, 20. They did measure their chronotypes, so are they owls or larks? They had two moderate evening types, 13 of those neither types, the little canaries and they had 10 moderate morning types, and they excluded the definites, the extreme chronotypes. They got them to do 200 meter time trials, and there are all the times at which they performed the test, and performed the test including the dreaded 2 a.m. in the morning. I should just put it in that the way that they structure this is you don't do it in sequence, because obviously there'll be a, t a fatiguing effect as it goes by, so they actually randomize the order in which they um, did it, and so it takes quite some time to to do this, but it's, it's, it's a pretty well controlled experiment. And when they plot their swim performance, this is performance, they've transformed the data so it looks a bit neater, but I'll explain what that means now. And this is time of day here, so this is 2 o'clock in the morning, this is the 5 a.m. performance here, and this is um, 11 o'clock, and this is, uh, so the midnight would be in there, that's the 2 a.m. They've double plotted it so that you can see a nice sign, we, we're used to this little graph now in performance, and in this graph, because they've transformed the data, you go faster when, um, when the times are, are down here. So we can see that the fastest performance, sorry, I, I lie completely, it's, it's reversed. Yeah, no, I, I'm quite right, sorry. Um, the fastest performance is towards the end of the day, between, in these swimmers, between 8 and 11 o'clock at night, surprisingly. 
and they get quite slow at 2 a.m. and even worse at 5 a.m., which is similar to that other study, and then they speed up again. So again, more evidence for that. But for me, I had exactly the same question as you had. This doesn't account for chronotype, so the people that they're testing there and their um, personal circadian biology, and it also doesn't account for habitual training time of day, which has got to have an effect. I couldn't believe that nobody had looked at that. Okay, that was just to show you that it's matched to temperature once again. And so it wasn't really surprising also that although those two studies were done which showed nice conclusive evidence, there were a whole lot of studies here which couldn't find any circadian or diurnal variation in sports performance. And these kind of just got ignored, as I said, and the textbooks continued to teach that it was all about um, best performance at the end of the day. So those are my two questions. What about chronotype and what about habitual training? And so I read this study. It was published in 2008. It's only a pilot study, so one must be careful. But I, pilot studies are, are valuable because they often, it's like a case study. It's just giving you initial evidence that this might be an area that's deserving of further exploration. So they looked at college rowers who typically trained in the morning, between 5 and 7 in the morning. As we know, rowers do that um, to fit it in before varsity. But they also had um, one evening or training session per week as well. They chronotyped them. They had eight owls, four larks, and four neither types. And this is not surprising because they're young adolescents. So we would expect to have um, more owls in this cohort. Again, it's a tiny sample size. We've got entire 16 people here. Um, they did a 2,000 meter time trial on an ergo, and when I speak about life-like life, life performance, ergometry performance on a rower is actually a very good marker of performance, a predictor of performance in the boat. So I take this as being, as being a pretty good substitute, even though it's more in a laboratory type setting. And they got them to do the time trials at their habitual morning training session, or in the afternoon when they habitually did their afternoon training session. And what did they look? When they put the data together, they saw that all 16 of them went faster in the morning by about 2.4 seconds. So over a 2,000 meter time trial, that's a half a percent performance. If you think about that in terms of, if you think about the Oxford-Cambridge boat race, 2.4 seconds is quite a smashing. So I'd be quite happy to take that performance improvement in the, in the, in the morning. And um, it's interesting that, that the entire group um, as a whole was faster. When they separate them out, by their chronotypes, and again, it's a pilot study with minute numbers, but this is just an indicator of where one should look. When they looked at the owls, so these are the evening types, they didn't have any difference between the mornings and the evening performance. And so I think what's happening there is that the owls innately should perform better at the end of the day. It makes sense that it better suits their um, physiology. However, they were training in the morning. So I feel like that morning training kind of flattened out any difference that might have been there to start with between their morning and their evening sessions. The larks went faster in the morning by 4.8 seconds. Again, that's a smacking. So I would expect them to be better at the beginning of the day, worse at the end of the day. Plus, they trained in the morning. So they've sort of added 1 plus 1 equals 2 here. And then the neither types, who are the ones that can go um, either way, they probably should have been a bit faster in the evening. But with the morning um, training, they were faster in the morning by about 2 seconds. So that was quite a eureka study for me. So I thought, well, let's see if we can repeat that in swimming just with a slightly larger and older um, group of people because they had a bias towards um, these teen-oriented owls. And I wanted to know, well, what about sort of adults who don't have that teen um, uh, bias in them? So we looked at 200-meter swimming time trial performance and rate of perceived exertion and mood state at 6.30 and at 8.30. And we used trained swimmers taking into account their chronotype, their habitual training time of day. And we also looked at um, their genotype for one of their clock genes, which is associated with, um, with uh, your um, circadian biology. But I'm not going to go into that side of things. I just want us to focus on the chronotype. So if I had just presented the data like this, I would have been one of those studies that got sort of swept away because look at that, we didn't see any difference in time between the morning and the evening performances. In fact, they were remarkably similar. Um, and this was despite the fact that there wasn't really a weight difference between the two, that their body temperature was actually lower. It was lower in the morning, so shouldn't they have been slower? And they had had less sleep in, ahead of the morning time trial because of having to wake up earlier to get to the trial. So um, despite all of that, there, there would have been no performance. But then I separated the results out by the, um, 
the neither types and the larks. And the reason I did that was when we recruited these participants, not a single one of them came out to be an owl. It's just one of those things. So we had no owls. We had only neither types and morning types. And what you can see here is that um, I'll just explain the concept of this graph. These are the morning types and the neither types, and this is their performance. And essentially, this direction of this um, little bar here indicates that our larks, the morning types, were faster in the morning, which is totally what you would expect, and the neither types were actually faster in the, um, in the evening. And the same is when I had a look at when they habitually trained. Those who habitually trained in the morning, not surprisingly, faster in the morning, and those who habitually trained in the evening were faster in the evening. So not surprising and really um, quite nice. I think uh, that was the genotype. I'm not going to do that. So when you group swimmers by their chronotype and their training time of day, then you start to see this diurnal variation in performance. So it's so logical, and I just couldn't believe that no one had thought of doing that. It really wasn't rocket science. And at the same time, when we grouped people by their chronotype as well as their training time of day, the two effects were additive. So that the morning types who trained in the morning had the biggest morning advantage, which absolutely makes sense. And the neither types who trained in the evening had the biggest um, end of day advantage. Yeah, so that's just a little bit um, of that. So adaptation to training is for sure greatest at your habitual training time of day. That certainly makes sense. The precise mechanisms still need to be elucidated, but for sure it's not temperature driven. <laughs> Rather, it's something more complex related to your body clock. And chronotype may indeed be a contributing factor. So along the same lines that, uh, sorry, so just to the take home messages here is that your circadian behavior, so it's not that easy to go around and measure people's innate circadian rhythms. Because to do that, I would need to put you in a black box for about 72 hours, take a number of measurements, including melatonin and body temperature, and then we could look and see what you are. Measuring somebody's chronotype with a questionnaire is really easy to do, and that seems to certainly give a good indicator of their um, innate circadian biology. So it's certainly a proxy measure, but by measuring circadian behavior, so that comprises both chronotype and chosen training time of day, because there are not too many larks that will choose to train in the evening, and there are not too many owls that will choose to train in the morning. That needs to be considered when you assess diurnal variation in performance for sure, and that athletes and coaches should obviously be aware of this um, because of the effect on training time could shift variation in performance, and it's probably particularly important when competition is known to take place in the evening or the morning. So in South Africa, our marathon events are typically in the morning, whereas many of our swimming finals are in the evening. So you can see, um, same with rugby matches, we very rarely play morning matches, occasionally we do, but more often than not, they're afternoon or early evening matches. So a time of day of competition certainly um, needs to be considered when you're looking at your um, members of your team and when they should train. Very general, the conclusion would be that rugby should start at five o'clock in the afternoon. It should start at five in the afternoon. Why would you say that? Because the performance is at the highest level. Because it's? I read from you that at that time, oh, the I performance see. is at the highest level. Only if you only are playing rugby with owls. Because <laughs> if you're playing rugby with um, larks, they may well be better primed to be stronger and um, in the earlier parts of the day. Okay. So that means yeah. that the coach Select yeah, no, I think it means that you have to manipulate training time of day. Okay, I would say that, yeah, yeah. yeah, depending on match time. So I would say that for your evening types, and we have these conversations with the Super 15 guys, we've done quite a lot of research with them, we'll say, yeah, you definitely want your, um, so you want to have chosen times um, of, of, of um, what's it called, strength sessions, because they have to do strength sessions most day. But if you can allow your players to choose when they want to train, they're probably going to get the best out of that session. There's obviously group sessions, which where we all need to be on the field, so the field type sessions, but then you want to make those at a slightly more neutral time of the day, I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. So that got me also thinking about who chooses to play what sport. And so we looked at some of the chronobiology, just just for fun, but really just also understanding um, how athletes um, perform at different times of the day made me think, well, I wonder if I'm a, I'm a lark and um, I love to do endurance at sports and I have no problem waking up at 4.30 to get to a 5.30 bike race start. That's cool. I can do that and I'm on my A game. 
but don't ask me, I remember at Varsity, to play those 8 p.m. hockey matches at night. Those were just horrid. Um, so we looked into the chronobiology of athletes, and uh, to just to put this um, very, very neatly, um, or concisely, we looked at hundreds and hundreds of athletes, and we did cyclists, runners, and Ironman triathletes, because they represent, um, in South Africa, our sort of ultra-endurance type athletes. So these were all ultras. These are not just marathon runners, these are comrades runners, these are um, uh, long distance bike riders and, and the Ironman triathletes. And when we gave them this questionnaire to determine their chronotype, what we found is that in all of them, the light blue bars here represent morning types. So 72% of the cyclists were morning types. Um, only 25% were neither types and there was a measly 3% of evening types. A similar pattern for the runners and the Ironman was slightly more um, normalized with slightly um, uh, fewer um, uh, morning types. But that's a really bizarre distribution. So everywhere else in the world, when you look at different populations around the world, you find that there's usually about 50 to 60 percent of the population are neither types. So the question is, where are our neither types? And then there are usually sort of 20 percent or, or even less at the evening and the morning type end of the spectrum which is certainly not we ha what we have. And very often, specifically in the European type populations, the evening type dominates. So this was just crazy. It just looked very different. Um, we then also just decided to compare them to our rugby players. So these are Super 15 rugby players. Um, there was only 1% of them were evening types. This, this distribution of neither types is a little bit more normal, but there's still a very strong predominance of morning types, even in the rugby players, which was super surprising, actually. I expected a more normal distribution there. And then when we looked at active controls, these are individuals who don't compete in any sport, they just go to the gym to keep fit. They looked slightly more normal. Now we're approaching 50% for this neither type, but we still have a massive lack of these um, evening types. And then when we looked at our couch potatoes, so these are people who don't do any physical activity at all, they're beginning to look a little bit more normal and slightly more like what we would see in the European population. So the evening types are creeping in here. And, um, but we still have quite a big predominance of morning types. So the short message there was that in South Africa, we just seem to have an over-representation of morning types. It could be the tool, absolutely. Maybe the tool, which is Eurocentric, is not very appropriate for the South African setting. Um, and that, that is something that we're looking into um, to, to design more um, African-dependent um, tools. The second thing could be that because we have a huge, a much higher volume of sunlight exposure, maybe we are more morning-oriented naturally, which could be part of that. And then the other thing that stuck out to me was that maybe there's some kind of conditioning, and we chatted about this yesterday, that through being physically active, regardless of what the level you're at, you may be conditioned to be more of a morning type. Um, and I'll explain what I think that means in a second. So the questions were, do athletes choose sports that best suit their circadian biology? So do morning types choose those ultra-endurance events with super early start times? And that certainly seems to be true. Um, does being physically active shift your chronotype or condition it towards and preference for mornings? And then again, what are the implications for performance? And so just to say, we've actually repeated the study in the Netherlands because we wanted to see if it was a South African Netherlands thing. I'm going too fast. And um, what we observed was that in their marathon runners, they actually had quite a similar distribution to us, quite a strong bias towards these morning types, whereas their active controls who were in the gym were much more of a normal distribution. So it certainly looks like there's a shift based on, um, on conditioning, and um, this over-representation of morning types is also probably quite a South African thing too. But anyway, I don't have time to go into more of that. I would love to, but I'm just conscious that we probably need to move on. Um, I just thought I would show you this. I thought it was quite funny that at the end of our swimming study, De Berger then decided to make a little cartoon of it, um, which I thought was quite funny. So, <laughs> cool. Okay. Sorry? Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> so... Um, this is the official saying, look, there's no doubt that, that this guy here is definitely um, of Olympics up, but, he's, but it's just that he's a, um, a night person. So he's got the talent, but he's competing at the wrong time of day. I thought that was quite funny. Okay. Um, so let's switch tacks now. So we've looked at this, um, the time to be awake, 
which is obviously I've taken physical activity to the extreme by looking at sports performance, but I hope that just gives you a little bit of insight into how activity is, um, or physical activity is directed to some extent by our circadian biology. So let's have a look at the time to be asleep. This is my favorite bit. Okay, so what is sleep exactly? Well, there are ways to sleep and there are ways not to sleep for sure, but no matter if, whether or where or how we do it, it's a, beha a behavioral state and that's important. Um, so it's an active behavioral state where we are perceptually disengaged from and to some extent unresponsive to the environment. So our body has ways in which it protects us, it basically cocoons us from the environment so that we can rest and it does that by limiting the amount at which we respond to the environment while we're asleep. Um, luckily it's a reversible state, it's very complex and it's regulated by multiple neuronal systems and usually it's accompanied by postural uh, recumbence and us being nice and still and having closed eyes. So I need to just take a step back because I guess the obvious question before we try to understand sleep anymore is to just think, well, why do we sleep? So there um, is a really nice review which I'm just going to pull from here which gives us what we know. So on one hand, it's for what we would call brain connectivity or plasticity. So it's reinforcement of the neural pathways in the brain. So much of that happens at nighttime. That's got to do with, um, on one hand, um, reinforcing um, or storing memory, but on the other hand, reinforcing any motor um, pathways that were developed during the day. So if I, I'm just gonna use a silly example, Let's say on a given day, I learned to plait somebody's hair. Okay, so this is gonna sound, if I just wanna give you an example. So to do that, I need to learn to coordinate my, my eyes and my fingers and create a nice little braid. And to do that, there are little circuits in the brain that need to be active in order for that activity to take place. So those pathways are reinforced essentially during the nighttime. So that um, the next day, if we were to repeat the task, it becomes more and more familiar. Um, there's a huge housekeeping fu um, function during night, which is um, the lymphatic system is in place to remove toxins from the brain. So there's a bathing of the brain, um, which allows moving out of toxins and um, essentially cleaning up. There's a period of reduced caloric um, use, which seems a bit odd. So you would think, well, why do we need to reduce our 24 hour um, energy usage? And I guess it's less of an issue now, but for sure when we were hunter-gatherers, if that's indeed what we were at some point, then um, we probably had to conserve energy a little bit more. So by having a period of downtime allowed for the times when we didn't have free access to, to food. Um, it restores our energy brain stores. It's critical for immune support. This is one of my favorite things about sleep. So when you're awake, the part of your immune system that is active is that which protects you from inhaled and ingested and absorbed pathogens. And that makes sense because that's what you're exposed to during that part of the day. But when you're asleep, the part of your immune system that is highly active is the one that creates antibodies against the pathogens to which you've been exposed. And it's also important for removing a mutated cells so that we don't have a lower risk of, develop of developing tumors, for example. So it's an incredibly important time for our immune system to be active then. And then obviously it reverses any performance loss which is associated with wakefulness. By performance loss, I mean cognitive performance. So you'll know that as the day goes by, you get more tired, you're not able to think quite as clearly as you did compared to earlier in the day. And the same with physical performance. Um, and so obviously we're able to reverse that by resting for the next day. But the real key is that without sleep, we wouldn't live. Obviously the experiments in humans are not possible to conduct, but they have done some experiments in, um, in rats. And this was a really, really, um, I think pretty um, awesome experiment that was done by Reshafen et al. In, in the early 1980s. And what they did was they kept these rats awake by letting them live on this little circuit over here. Oops, I'm sorry. And they um, had access to, um, ad, ad libitum access to food and water. And they had little electrodes on their brains so they could look at brain activity. And every time that they noticed that the rats wanted to, started to go into a sleep state, 
they would start to move the little um, disc so that the rats had to move. They didn't make them exercise, they just had to move. And if they didn't move, they would plop off into this water under there, which is not what they wanted. So it, by this means, they were able to keep the rats awake for an incredibly long time just to observe what happened. And these sleep-deprived rats, they suffered severe pathology and death while the control rats, those that were allowed to sleep, didn't. What I think is really interesting, don't worry about the um, detail here, but this is a very diverse range of pathology, which tells me that there is huge inter-individual susceptibility to sleep deprivation and that many systems of the body are affected by sleep deprivation. And also the time of death, death range from five to 33 days. So um, we obviously can't directly apply this to humans, but we're pretty sure that we have been designed or that we've evolved or been created in order that sleep is critical to our survival and that without it, um, we would be in a state worse for the wear. But it takes a long time to get there. We can't survive very long without water, but we can survive quite a long time without sleep, which is obviously there for a reason. But it also means it's slightly easier to abuse your sleep too. So as scientists, we love to measure things. And when we measure sleep, we use a, primarily use a technique called polysomnography. Um, so this is what it would look like when the person's kitted up. So they have electrodes here on their head so that we can measure brain activity. Because sleep is controlled by the brain, it's very important that we can understand what's happening in the brain so that we can um, under, further, further understand sleep. We also have a look at heart activity, so there's an ECG. We look at eye movement, so we've got two little electrodes over here because that's important to determine stage of sleep, whether we're in rapid eye movement sleep or not. And then we'll look at muscle activity, so that especially around the chin, which is important for REM sleep, or the legs for um, sleep-related disorders like periodic limb movement. And then we'll also look at factors around respiration, so um, oxygen saturation. We'll look at, um, at, at breathing expansion of both the chest and the abdomen, really to look for disorders like sleep apnea, but more on that another time. So if I were just to zoom in on the EEG component, what we are able to see is when we look at an awake brain, the EEG trace would look a little bit like this. So it's what we call low amplitude, high frequency um, um, uh, trace. When a person goes to sleep, they go into stage one, which is the first very light phase of sleep, and you can see a slight change. There's a slight increase in amplitude and a slight slowing of the, of the wave. And this person has a very um, high, still a pretty high level of consciousness. If I were to come and tap you, or the dog were to, were, were to bark, you would, you would wake up. And then you progress into stage two, and you can see the change in the shape here of the, of the EEG trace. Um, it's, the amplitude's up a little bit. And um, this is where we spend most of our night. And that's, um, pr it's not impossible to wake a person in that, but if the dog were to bark, we would see it register in the EEG trace, but you wouldn't wake up. Um, and then if we were to put you, if you were then to go into stage three, there's no longer stage four, by the way, they've changed the, um, the way that we score. You can see we're going, this is our slow wave sleep or our deep sleep. And it's quite obvious to see why it's called that. Um, and this is where we are really quite dead to the world. And then together, these three make up what we call non-REM sleep, so non-rapid eye movement sleep. Whereas rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep looks much more like stage one or even a little bit more like awake. So the, per the brain is highly active. It's doing a hell of a lot of processing at that point, but you generally have muscle paralysis so that you're unable to move and act out your dreams. Quite fortunate. So if I were to measure sleep in a person over the night and then I were to put together all of this um, EEG information, I would be able to create something like this, which is called a hypnogram. So this here would be hours of sleep. So this is an eight hour um, sleep. And this is, this is moving from awake down into stage three. So the person is awake. This is the time it takes them to fall asleep. Then they drop off into light sleep, stage one, and then into stage two. And then they have a nice long bout of slow wave sleep. And then they pop up and have a little tiny burst of REM. So that there is a sleep cycle. And that takes anywhere between 90 and 100 minutes. And we usually have between three and six of those in a night, depending on how long you sleep for. And so you can see that the cycle more or less repeats as the night goes by, but this com the composition of the cycles changes in that we tend to do the majority of our slow wave sleep in the first third of the night. 
and we do the majority of our rapid eye movement sleep in the latter third of the night. And then this would be an awakening, um, a proper awakening, where the person might get up, go to the bathroom, have a sip of water, look at the time, that kind of thing. Everybody wakes up during the night. That's quite normal. If you only wake up once, I consider that to be quite abnormal. Um, there's a very natural break in our sleep here at about halfway through the, the, the night. So very often you'll wake up, depending on what your bedtime is, you'll notice that the time on the clock will be somewhere between midnight and three in the morning. That's very much a sort of a natural break in your sleep. So everybody pretty much wakes up then. And it's just a matter of whether or not you're able to fall asleep after that that counts. Um, this slow wave sleep here is when we th understand most of our physical repair and recovery to do. To, to take place. So we think that this is absolutely critical primarily for our cardiovascular repair and recovery. Whereas REM sleep, and obviously the um, immune system is highly active with that, st that part as well. REM sleep is when we do um, our mental and um, psychological recovery. So we process a lot of what we have been thinking, feeling exposed to. So it's an absolutely critical aspect of our sleep. And I can't remember I mentioned this yesterday, and forgive me if I did, but they've done studies in rats, did I tell you this, where they deprived them of REM sleep? No. Um, so they did that again by following their EEG during a night, and every time they went into a REM period, they would wake the rat up, so they wouldn't let them sleep through. And ultimately, those rats died. And so the short of it is, is that doesn't happen if we deprive of slow wave sleep. So for some reason, our bodies hugely value REM sleep, and um, so much to the, um, so, uh, to such an extent that without it, we don't survive, and that if we lose REM sleep on any one given night, we will have what we call REM rebound the following night, so the body will pack it in, usually to the, at the expense of slow wave sleep to make sure that we aren't um, chronically REM sleep deprived. So on an any given night, a normal sleep should have about 50% of our time in stage two, we should only spend about 3 to 5% in stage 1. We shouldn't spend a lot of time there. People who have poor sleep, who wake up a lot or have fragmented sleep, often spend 15 to 20% in, in this light stage of sleep. Um, so that's pretty debilitating. You should spend about 20% a third of your night, a fifth of your night or so in, in slow wave sleep. Um, and we should have around a quarter of our night should be spent in REM sleep. So that's what a normal structure would be. So when we assess people's sleep and if we see that those percentages don't match that, then we, can, we, we will know whether or not we should be concerned about lack of REM, lack of slow wave sleep, or just too many awakenings. So here comes the circadian bit. We have to think about how sleep is regulated. Um, and they're really two um, uh, interacting oscillatory processes. On the one hand, our circadian rhythms are involved in regulating sleep, and on the other hand, there's something called our sleep homeostat, which must be at play. Let me explain this. So we know this from yesterday. We understand a bit more about the body clock now, and it's the master clock which regulates our sleep from a circadian aspect. You know that it's located in the SCN, it's endogenous, it's self-sustained, and it generates 24-hour sleep patterns. So ultimately, it determines your preferred timing of sleep and wakefulness. So that makes sense. A person with a slightly shorter circadian rhythm or someone who's more um, biased towards a morning type will have a preferred earlier bedtime and earlier wake time. Does that make sense? However, we have to take into account that through the days and weeks and months, we accumulate sleep debt. And that has got to account for how and when and how deeply we sleep. So that, that's the job of the sleep homeostat. So we call this fondly the hourglass oscillator. So it tracks the history of sleep and wakefulness and therefore tracks debt. So it does that by saying, well, I know that you as a human need, I'm making up a number here, so seven and a half hours of sleep per night. But consistently for the last week or two weeks or 10 years, you've been getting six hours of sleep. Um, and so the difference is your debt. People often ask me, do I need to pay back all of my sleep debt? And the answer is no, thank goodness. Otherwise, we would um, not be very um, functional. But we have to pay back a portion of it. And that's when the sleep homeostat comes into play, is that once your debt starts to get a little bit too heavy, it says, I don't care if you're an owl. You're sleeping today, and it could be 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's forcing you to nap or it's making you to go to bed at a ridiculous 9 o'clock at night, which you would never dream of usually. 
and that's the, the oscillator saying, that's it, you're done. I don't care that you normally go to bed at midnight. You have to catch up sleep now. So it does this by working on something called sleep pressure, which increases while we're awake and dissipates while we're asleep. So you can actually feel sleep pressure if you pay attention to your body. The longer that you're awake for, the um, more of that desire or feeling that you have that, oh, I think I'd quite like to go to sleep right now. So when you're awake, um, after a good night's rest and you have very little sleep debt, you have no desire to sleep, you have no sleep pressure. But as the day or days wear on and you don't have enough sleep, that desire to sleep is going to be high, and that's your sleep pressure. So essentially, the homeostat maintains the duration and intensity of a sleep. So a person who is severely sleep deprived will need to sleep longer. The homeostat will force them to sleep longer than what their body clock might ask them to do, and it'll give them usually a deeper sleep so that they can catch up. Yes. So that's, um, that's awesome. I think anybody who is in a hard face um, stage of work or even a high stress situation where you've maybe lost someone or whatever, you'll notice you have to work. You're being paid to be there. People are depending on you. You have self-expectation. You might be building a business. There, there are many reasons. So you give it your all and you are there longer than you need to be, you work really hard, you're mentally very um, challenged and stimulated, and to get everything done, you need to cut out sleep time because that's where we steal extra time from in the day. Um, so you can do that for a couple of months. Some people manage it quite successfully for a couple of years, but to maintain that state, you have to be in quite a, um, I call it a, a sympathetic state. So if you think about your autonomic nervous system, you think about fight and flight and rest and digest. Um, so there's this balance between being quite up and high, sort of there's in that fight and flight state. You shouldn't really be in that state too much, but it's often a way that we survive. There's a lot more adrenaline and cortisol floating around. We'll typically have a lot more inflammation. And that is the way that we typically survive the very busy work time. So we are not quite as zen and relaxed and in that parasympathetic state as we should be. And then when you go on holiday, you crash, firstly to catch up all the sleep that's been missing, and secondly your immune system typically tra cr crashes because now you've got this massive withdrawal from this sympathetic state going down into this parasympathetic state. You no longer have that cortisol and adrenaline keeping you going all the time and your body just, it's no longer in this protective state. It goes into this more rest and digest. And one of the things that often happens is you then develop um, these immune symptoms or you become sick. Um, so it's just that massive change from one state to the other which seems to be the trigger for a person getting sick. And then you'll notice that your sleep will be long in that period. You'll do loads of sleeping because you're catching up, and then by the second week, often your sleep will start to shorten again because you're sleep replete and it goes to whatever your normal sleep duration should be. Cool. Okay, so if we have a look at just how these two processes work together, the homeostatic sleep drive, if we've had a good night's sleep and we don't have much sleep debt, when we wake up, we should have no limited homeostatic sleep drive because we're bouncy and we're fresh. But as the day goes by, obviously, we become more tired. And then there's a time here um, at which we now need to go to sleep. This drive is so big, and it's pushing us to be asleep, and it dissipates the following morning. Whereas the circadian alerting, because the circadian system during the day, we understand its role to be to keep you alert so that you can function during the daytime. So there's this big alerting drive, essentially. And this alerting drive doesn't have to be very strong in the morning, because you should be sleep replete. But as the day goes by and your fatigue sort of starts to set in, there has to be a more and more drive from the circadian system to keep you awake until bedtime, and then that drive can, can, can pull off. So on a molecular basis, circadian ryth um, rhythmicity and sleep homeostasis are very closely related. So we have our sleep-wake cycle, which is dependent in part on our circadian system, so that's the timing, which is in part determined by our clock genes, 
but it's also um, influenced by the light-dark cycle. But we have this sleep homeostat also, which influences the sleep-wake cycle, and then these um, cycle together. And not to forget, I mentioned that social jet lag yesterday. Social timing plays a huge role because you can say, well, circadian and homeostat be damned. I'm actually going to do this because this is how I choose to be. So um, that's really how the, how the two are, are influenced. So a healthy sleeper, and there are not too many of these people who exist, I must say, the timing of their sleep would be in sync with their innate circadian rhythm. So if you can get a feeling for what your body wants, and many of you, I'm sure, have done that naturally anyway, you would want to sleep more or less when your body's asking you to sleep. It's really helpful when your sleep and circadian parameters are aligned with the environment, which means that those of us that are neither types or moderate morning or evening types have a much easier lot here because it's easier for us to synchronize with the normal light-dark cycle. It's the extreme morning and evening types that have a bigger problem. They typically don't have a problem falling asleep, and they typically stay asleep quite easily. They don't have too much sleep debt. They're awake, feeling refreshed and perky. And most importantly, they have high optimal levels of daytime function because that's really why we sleep. We sleep to recover so that we can do what we need to do during the daytime. So if this is not happening, then there's something wrong probably with what's happening during your sleep. So in terms of sleep abnormalities, this is, um, these are little actograms which are measured by um, people wearing little watches which can look at when they're active and when they're asleep. And so essentially each one of these green lines is a, um, is a day. Um, so this person here is, um, this is their sleep. They go to bed at around, this, I think this line is at 11 o'clock and that's when they wake up. This would be a Thursday, this would be a Friday, that's a Saturday sleep and a Sunday sleep and then Monday to Friday and the following week. So that would be a normal sleep pattern where for the most part their time is relatively consistent, duration is consistent, and um, wake-up time is quite consistent, obviously controlled or constrained by work. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here because I want to save this for the last day where we look at optimizing sleep. But I just want to show you what happens from a circadian perspective when sleep goes wrong. So this would be a case of insomnia. In this case, this person doesn't have too much of a problem falling asleep but they can't maintain sleep. So it's very fragmented, fragmented, it's of poor quality, and they almost always need to supplement with naps to try to um, reduce their daytime levels of sleepiness. This would be hypersomnia. So this is a person with an excessively long sleep need. So their natural sleep need would be in excess of 11 or 12 hours a day. So they've got good solid sleep, but it's just not enough, and they even need to supplement with napping. This is delayed sleep phase disorder. So this we would typically see in those extreme um, owls where bedtime is extremely late. You can see it's around three or four in the morning and then wake up time is nev never earlier than about eight or nine, but if they had any choice, they'd be sleeping till one o'clock the next day. So you can see how difficult that particular pattern would be if you needed to do a normal nine to five job. That's why very often individuals with this condition are, make fantastic shift workers. Um, Advanced sleep phase is quite the opposite. We have a super early bedtime, seven, eight or so in the, whoops, in the, in the morning, in the evening, sorry, and then very early four, five wake up times. This is, this is free running. Remember we spoke about this and we typically see that in, in individuals, for example, who are blind or if we were to live in a black box, this is what we would look like. Um, so this would be a, a blind person whose um, rhythm is consistently moving out each day and that's irregular sleep. So that's complete ablation of the SCN would do something like that so the body clock doesn't function and there's absolutely no rhythm to the sleep pattern. So I just want to quickly end now. I've got seven minutes. Um, I'm just going to go through this quite quickly. We can always come back to it a little bit on, fr on Friday if we don't quite finish about some of the strategies around resetting a broken clock because that's really got to do with also helping to restore um, normal sleep. So typically we would look at timed light exposure and we would look at melatonin. There is some thinking around exercise and meal timing because we know that those are other, sorry, we know that exercise and meal timing are also zeit gibbers. They're able to reset your body clock, but the strongest um, or the places where we can have the most influence are for sure with light and melatonin. So timed light exposure would be around trying to reset or shift a circadian um, phase. So we know that light is your primary zeit giver or entrainer, and specifically it's natural daylight, blue light, 
which is preferred, but we can use artificial light to do re-entrainment, specifically if it's higher, if it's more like, like something like a cool white LED, which is higher in the lower frequency or wavelength light. And it's a combination of both avoiding and exposing to light at the correct time of days. So for example, if we want to delay a person's phase, so to phase delay means we want to shift a rhythm later, then we would need to have um